From the beginning of time, God's one desire has been to be known and praised among all the peoples of the earth. And yet when we look at the state of the world, nearly half of the global population has never heard the gospel. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God is calling each of us to join him in his mission to take the good news of Jesus to all peoples that they may know. We welcome you today, and we are so thankful that you're with us. I want to pray as we continue worship today. I know there are a lot of things probably going on in your life. There's certainly a lot of things going on in our nation. There's a lot of things going on in the world, and we just need to pray and seek God's help. We'll have a time of ministry uh, after the message today, uh, but right now I just want to pray uh, that the Holy Spirit would touch our hearts so that we might know our God and uh, more of him today. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray for um, today, God, your spirit to work powerfully in our heart uh, in a way that, Lord, we would have opportunity to know more of you. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you, Lord, that your love is not conditioned on our performance. Lord, it's conditioned on what you have done for us, who you are, Lord, and the work that you accomplished for us in giving your son to be our savior. I thank you, Jesus, for your perfection. I thank you, Jesus, that in every way you did for us what we could never do for ourselves, in living that we might have righteousness, in dying that we might have forgiveness, being buried in the grave that we deserve to die in, and after three days rising again to provide new life and hope for relationship with you now and forever for all who believe. God, we thank you for your unconditional love and we thank you, Lord, for your generous grace. We thank you for your finished work. And Lord, I pray today that you would lead us again to know who you are, to remember your heart, to remember what you've done and to put our hope in you. Lord, for those who have needs today and it's all of us, Lord, I pray your grace and help in our time of need. I pray you just pour out blessing upon your people and help us, Lord. Thank you for your word, and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have as a church today to, to, to hear your voice speak. And I pray, God, for David and myself, Lord, that we would just be faithful to testify to you. And, Lord, that your spirit would work in wonderful ways for the glory of your name, Jesus, here and around the world, we pray. Amen. Well. We're back. We're back. This is uh, David Frazier. I am Barrett Bowden, and we are so glad to have opportunity to join with you. If you got your Bibles this morning, I would encourage you to get them open right now to the book of Revelation. We're going to start in chapter 7 this morning. Just put your finger there. We're going to hold it. Okay, so if you got your Bible, Revelation chapter 7. If you don't know already, we are in the middle of... Go month. Go month. <laughs> and uh, we take uh, time every January to focus on God's heart as a God of uh, the nations and his heart for us as his church to embrace the nations and to be purposed to see that the nations might op have opportunity to know him just as we do. And we've been doing that. Uh, we started last week and today we'll be doing it again. Here at our church, we have a missional mindset. And by that, we mean this. Um, we have a clear calling and we have active involvement to live to see the gospel spread and churches planted here in Memphis at home, and also around the world, all right? So if you haven't understood this measure yet, I would encourage you to, to, to make notes this morning. Note takers make effective disciple makers, all right? So I would encourage you to take notes this morning so that you could uh, follow along. But this is one of our core measures here at ICC, and we're going to be talking about this all month. So, And that's what led us to make the theme. So we're going to look at the theme, our, our theme and hope. For this whole month is that they may know, you may say, who are they? What is this theme? Where did it come from? It came from Psalm 67. So let's look at that. May God be gracious to us and bless us. We love this verse. We always have it on our walls. Sometimes your grandmother might give it to you, all knitted up. And it's a wonderful verse that, that God may shine his face upon us. But why? 
Why are we blessed? That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. This is Psalm 67, one through three. And this is our sort of our anchor. It's gonna keep us on focus this whole month. And it's really the heart of what, of what church is. It's not just a monocultural ministry here in Memphis. And basically, we have set this as our theme. And last week, we looked at blessed to be a blessing. And that's basically where we got that from, that they may know. Yeah. Well, today, if you're taking notes, uh, the title um, of today's message, last week we looked at why we go. Um, and today, we're going to be looking at to whom we go, Okay. To Whom We Go is the title of today's message. And um, if you're looking for our core truth for the day, each week we have a core truth that we write down, kind of the big idea of the passage we'll be looking at. Today there's two main ones. Uh, But our core truth for the day is this, all right? Um, And really we're going to be looking at the, the whole idea of all nations, all peoples throughout the message today. The Great Commission is about peoples, not nations, all right? The Great Commission, hopefully everybody's writing this down, the Great Commission is about peoples, not nations. Mm -hmm. Jesus came that every nation, tribe, people, and language would have opportunity to trust and to treasure him. Mm -hmm. All right? The Great Commission is about peoples, not nations. Jesus came that every nation tribe, people, and language would have opportunity to trust and to treasure him. All right? So some big words in here, all nations, all peoples. We're going to be talking about that a lot today. Hopefully everybody's already turned to Revelation chapter 7. Are you there in your Bibles? Yeah? All right, Revelation chapter 7. And what we're going to do today is we're going to be looking at two verses as we start, verses 9 and 10. All right? So Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. If you look at the picture of heaven, all right, Mm -hmm. we talked about last week how God began all things. Revelation is a a picture of how God will end all things, right? How he will bring all things to its full and final restoration. And here's, here's the picture of heaven that John saw. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a day. So, what a day, right, David? What a day. What a day is going to be. We're all going to be there. What a day. So, if you're wondering uh, where our core truth came from, you're going to see it throughout the scriptures today, but you see it also here reflected in Revelation chapter 7, all right? What you see here is God's heart and God's purpose in all things. There will come a day that around the throne of God in heaven, there will be people, and he describes it here, nation, tribes, people's language, full representation. So some words we can write down, right? Multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual. This is who our God is, and this is God's heart as he looks at the world, and this is God's purpose and redemption from start to finish. He desires for his people to be a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual people. So we're going to be looking at this as we go through today, David. Um, Last week, if you were with us, we went through the Old Testament, and it was a 30,000-foot flyover. We touched on many books of the Old Testament. But what we came away seeing was the idea of reaching all nations was not just started in the New Testament. And that's why we started last week. Sometimes we think it all starts right at the beginning with Jesus' ministry, but we saw in the Old Testament. So if you didn't watch it, go back and watch it, and you'll see that it was God's plan A from the beginning. Sometimes you just think God's all about Israel, and he's just loving on Israel, but that's not what God's heart was. He was for all nations. And so we're going to continue, we're going to see this narrative continue in the New Testament, and we're going to be focusing today on the life, ministry, and message of Jesus. That's going to be our focus today. And last week, you'll remember there was a promise of a coming Messiah. But what kind of Messiah would he be? Well, let's look at Isaiah 11.10, just as an example. It says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. 
In him will the Gentiles hope. Gentiles, the other nations, all the peoples. So Israel should have been picking up on this. And that's what we noticed in the Old Testament. They should have been seeing that God's heart was not just uh, for them. So we see it right at the beginning in the early verses of the New Testament. We read that Jesus is is in the line of David, the son of Jesse. And by the way, in Matthew 1, Jesus' genealogy includes four Gentile women. And their names are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Did you know that? They were in Jesus' genealogy. And this is just God's way of showing once again, he's not just about the people yeah, so of Israel. As soon as the Messiah enters, it's like, hello, here he is, the one who will be the hope of the Gentiles. That's and here right. he is who includes Gentiles right there in his lineage. These are amazing stories. Yeah. Go yeah. Right back in their life and you think, how could they have been put into a genealogy, which, which is very important in the Bible whenever you see genealogies. Yeah. In Luke 2, 29 and 30. We, I love this story. Yeah. It's says, baby dedications. Everybody loves baby dedications. Right. Here's Jesus's. And his parents come to dedicate him at the temple. At Jesus's dedication, we read this old man, Simeon, says, when he sees the child, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. So he's about to die. He's been waiting to die. And he says, let me depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. There it is. There it is. And he's doing this in the temple because he got it. He was prophesying a light for revelation to the Gentiles, or we might as well just fill in the word all peoples, all nations, and for the glory to your people, Israel. Yeah. So David's not saying, we're not saying here God's not interested in Israel. It's that he's interested in all these peoples. So we're just going to keep on looking at these early verses, Barrett. Matthew 2, 1, we see the wise men. You've heard the story at Christmas. Where did they come from? These are men that came from the east to Jerusalem to see and worship Jesus. And they tell us that they came far away. So these are once again foreigners. Oh, and it's so cool because it's, it's this picture of God, David, that, I mean, our God is a God who is seeking out all peoples. Mm. And he's putting something in the minds and hearts of these people from a non-Jewish nation yes. to come and seek salvation in Jesus. It's and not, it just shows us God's heart for the nations from the very beginning of And he's not arrival. hiding it. Yeah. It's not a secret. Yeah. Israel should have caught it. Yeah. We should catch it. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, in John 10, 16, Jesus says, have you ever seen this verse? I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Did you ever think of what that means? He's basically saying, hey, Jesus, come on. Let's, get, let's just stay right here in town. We build you a little place. We'll start a little Bible school. And Jesus says, No. Yeah. I have sheep that are not of this fault. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my vo- voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus is clearly making it very obvious to all the Jews he was speaking to. I'm interested in the other nations. Yeah. Then we see Jesus in other of these stories. We're just going to touch on him. He's always moving towards foreigners. You see him speaking to Samaritans which were not loved or they were prejudiced toward. And then you see him talking to Romans, interacting with Romans and finding faith among them. And you know that probably made the, the, uh, the Jews uncomfortable. Why are you speaking to our enemies? And then we look in Matthew 24, 14, it says, and this gospel, in case you missed it this far, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations And then the end will come. Interesting. When's Jesus coming back? There it is. We have our mission here. Um, Then you see in Mark 13, 10, the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. Once again, Barrett. Yeah. And then we jump to Luke 24, 46, and it says repentance for forgiveness. For the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So Jesus is talking about this all the time. So Yeah. I mean, it's all over. It's all over. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, all right? You're in Revelation. You might have been flipping around. We've been pouring out a fire hose here, so I don't know how, how much you've been flipping with David as he's gone through this. But let's go to Matthew chapter 28, because there's a passage here that's a very well-known passage that is a very... Uh, foundational passage as it relates to just understanding God's heart and understanding the church's role 
in seeing redemption come through the gospel message of Jesus to all people. So Matthew chapter 28, if you've got your Bible, and we're going to look starting at verse 18, all right? 18 to 20 is where we're going to be. Many of you know this as the Great Commission, all right? So essentially, Jesus has accomplished uh, the work of redemption in his life, in his death for the forgiveness of sin, and now he's resurrected, and he's speaking some final words, David, Mm -hmm. to his disciples, right? He's wanting to make sure, if you hadn't gotten it before now, (laughs) here's my heart, here's what I'm about, and here's what I want you to be about. Jesus came to the, and said to them, here's what he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right? Um, We're going to mark this up for just a second. We're going to camp out here for just a second because I want to make sure everybody understands this. This is the Great Commission. We've said that. Um, If you look here how it's bookended, okay, you can underline this first phrase and underline this last phrase. I consider these like bookends to the Great Commission. Sometimes they're overlooked and they're really important because what Jesus is saying here is, he says, hey guys, like I am in control of all things. Like I'm the one who's sovereignly overseeing everything now. Exactly. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I'm a promise keeper. I'm a promise fulfiller. I'm going to make sure that there's one thing that gets done, right? I am the one who is building my church. Jesus said that to his disciples earlier. I will build my church, right? Mm-hmm. This is not your thing. It's my thing. I mean, I'm, I want you to be a part of it, but this is my thing. Habakkuk, we looked at last week, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the water covers the seas. He's like, hey, I, 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 I got this. I can handle it, all right? All authority has been given to me. The other bookend is, you're not on your own. Hey, don't you know? Like, look here. I am with you, and I'm not going to depart from you. Like, I will be with you in this, all right? So I'm not just saying, good luck, guys. I'll see you in, in it's a couple of millennium. No, I, he's like, no, look, I am very much with you. Not only am I sovereignly overseeing this with my power, but I am sustaining you with my presence. Bookends. Now, the core of the Great Commission, the second thing I want to mark up is this phrase right here. The only imperative in the entire Great Commission, people misunderstand it a little yep. bit, yep. but the only imperative in the whole Great Commission is make disciples, all right? So this is what he wants his disciples, he wants us to be about. He's saying, I want you to live your life in such a way that you're constantly looking to bring others into relationship with me, right? I am desirous for you to live your life in such a way that the the ripple effects of your life are other people, your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, and beyond, are coming into relationship with me. As I have lived with you with intentionality to bring you into relationship with God, I want you to live with others with the intentionality of bringing them into relationship with God. And notice he does not say make converts, drive toward decisions. He's saying I want you to make disciples. Yes, reaching them is important, baptizing, but also we see teaching them is important. It's a whole life thing. So I want you to be wholly invested with your life in the way I've been wholly invested in you for this purpose, that more can come into relationship with me because I am everything. I am life itself. Now, what we want to focus on today, I think most of us, David, by this point are going, yeah, okay, kind of get this. Kind of get, I, I know I've heard this before, make disciples. But here's what I want to focus on today. There's a description that Jesus gives as to how we are to do it and the scope of which we are to do it. Let's draw some arrows to two phrases. One is, go therefore. As you go. or Okay, so going. this is referring to the way mm-hmm. that we are to make disciples, all right? We're going to talk about this in a second, but there's two things here that I want you to write down. One is the way, and the other is the scope. So the way we are to make disciples is go therefore. We'll talk about it. The scope of our disciple making is of all nations. Do y'all see what Jesus is saying? So it's not just make disciples. There's a particular way he wants us to do it. There's a way in going, and there's a scope in view, the nation. So let's talk for a second, David, about the way, all right? All right. Going. The going. All right. All right. So last week, as you remember in the Old Testament, we talked about God's strategy for reaching the nations was not going out. They weren't going out to speak. It was a, it was a come and tell. Um, come and see. Come and see. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Barrett. 
uh, that it missed out. Matthew 28, 19 shows us uh, that God's strategy in the New Testament for reaching the nations now is go and tell. So we saw in the Old Testament that God was going to bless them in such an amazing way. The whole world was going to notice. All the nations were going to hear about their riches, their victories, their crops, the wisdom of Solomon. Yeah. And they were going to come and see about God. And that was how this was worked. Now, a little bit of shift here. This is a shift. This is go and tell. And he's sending them out. Jesus is not, he did not promise that the nations would come to them. This is not sit in Jerusalem. This is not sit at ICC here at church and wait for people to come to church. We can't wait for them to come. There must, we must take the initiative. Now, the goal in our going, as we've seen, is to yeah. make disciples. So as we go to make disciples from all nations, we, need, we, may, we, will, we may need to get on an airplane and go some places, maybe. Maybe we'll need to cross the city to connect with people, cross the street. But often we also have to cross cultural barriers. These, these are different peoples, different languages, different ethnic groups. We have to cross language barriers, ethnic barriers, um, and we may need to just engage with the internationals that are right here in town, yeah. or sometimes we have to this get is on a, the plane. This is a pretty fundamental shift, David, because I think when we hear, go therefore, make disciples, we, we automatically think, I got to get on an airplane and go somewhere. But if you, if you change this, and we'll yes. talk more about this, yeah, but if will. you understand the way as just going, meaning that I've got to move out of my comfort zone, out of my people group, out of my norms, yes. right? And I've got to cross these barriers. Yes. It's a much more helpful definition of go. And he sends us out. It says, as you go, he's sending us out with our jobs, with our children, with our families, using hospitality, our vocations. And sometimes we just think it's about a person getting on a plane, going to a place, yeah. learning a language. Yeah. That's not what it is. He, he says, yeah. as you go, and he says, and you take you with you. You, your family, and what you're doing. Yeah. So that's very and I, and I like the, the translation of go, not just being a one-time event, but it's as you are going. Yeah. So as you are crossing these barriers, you are to be about bringing people in a relationship with me. All right. The second part of, if we go back to Matthew 28, everybody do that, and we look back at the verse 19, and we see, go therefore and make disciples, and he qualifies it again. This is talking about the scope of all nations, all right? So the second thing we're going to make a list of is not only that we have the way, but we have the scope, all right? And the scope here is what? Y'all say it with me? All nations. All nations, exactly. So here, David, in church, what we're doing is we're seeing Jesus weave in this meta-narrative of the scripture that we talked about last week. Y'all remember us talking about last week how this is a thread that runs throughout the whole Bible? So here, after Jesus has finished his work of redemption on the cross, after he has risen again to new life, and after here he is commissioning his disciples and us to understand his purpose for us in all things, and he's including in this his God's eternal purpose of seeing a worshiping body that represents all nations all peoples, all tribes, all tongues. Jesus himself here in the Great Commission is helping us to understand, again, God's heart to redeem not just our own kind, but all kinds of people. Yeah. And for us to have a heart that matches his heart to be about the work of redemption for all kinds. So basically, David, he's going, okay, if you haven't gotten it already, yes. let me say it again. It's not just about you and your people. Right. It's not just about you and your nation. Like, I do care about Israel, but I care about more than that. So let yep. me just make sure. Here I am, the resurrected Christ. He said, let me just make sure you get it. This is about bringing people in relationship with me of all nations, of all people. So really, really important. And Barrett, that's what keeps a church healthy. That's what keeps us healthy when we always keep in mind God's bigger picture beyond ourselves and our kind. Yeah. And yet... And did, I was going to ask you, do you think they got it? They did not get it. They Barrett. didn't. How long did it take? <laughs> about Jesus is about to half leave. A day. He's about to leave. Okay, We're, we see Flip this over in the to book Acts of, chapter one. Acts, Acts, chapter, Acts one. chapter one. Y'all got it. Acts and, chapter and one. And many of you may know Acts one eight. You know he sends once again. He says you'll be my witnesses. But sometimes we forget that just before Jesus did this, he's about to be lifted. He's about to ascend. Ascend to heaven. Yeah. 
And these poor disciples, they had heard they're the kind of going, this has been great, Jesus. It's amazing you're raised from the dead. Yeah, we've heard you mention all these things. And they say in 1.6, so when they had come together, the disciples, they're sitting around and they're like, he's about to leave. Let's ask him. They asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Oh, no. It's as if some of them said, I got, I got my sword here. I'm ready. I, sharped it, I sharpened it last night. Are we going to take these Romans on? When's it going to be our day? And aren't we all like that? Right? Did we win the gold? Or uh, am I succeeding? Yeah. And, and it's just so normal. So don't be discouraged if you find <laughs> yourself getting a little too patriotic, a little too nationalistic yourself. Because it's the most common thing for all of us to love our, our own stuff, yeah. our, our own people. It's just almost comical. Yeah, Because, I mean, it. this had been the theme all through the beginning. He had just given a great commission, and here they're going, oh, so when, when is the whole thing for Israel going to happen? So Jesus says, okay, oh. all right, guys, thanks for asking. And then we, we look at Acts 1.8, and Jesus just to me, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say, be my witnesses. You believe on these things. You are, fo you are following me. You will be my witnesses. Yeah. And he's saying in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he's saying, you're going to go not just locally. You're going to keep on going. And, you know, we find out in history that the, the Christians just stayed in Jerusalem. Yeah. They just tried to build a mega church. They yeah. had James, the brother of Jesus. This is going great. And then yeah. persecution came. Yeah. And God scattered them. So they yeah. even had to be forced. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wonder, you know, I was talking to some pastors this past week, David. Uh, we had a gathering, a prayer gathering, some pastors in the city. And I spoke up and said, you know, I, because the church is going through a lot of changes right now. And with all that's going on in the world, the pandemic, what's going on in the country. And I just wonder, is God not sovereignly shaking things up again yep. to get us back to where we need to be? All churches around the world. Global glory. It's not just us. Every yeah. church wants to so huddle. It's not just about one nation, it's about all nations. Yep. That's what we see in the scripture. Now, if we go back to Matthew 28, another thing that I wanna show you here as we look at go and make disciples of all nations is to actually get into a little bit of a word study when it looks, when we talk about that phrase, all nations. So I think the next slide will have this. Um, in the Greek, and I don't do this to you guys much because I think I can usually study the original scripture enough and just explain it in English without having to like go geek on you, okay? Um, or Greek on you, no matter what you choose. You get it? You get it? You like that? Okay, good. So, um, but I do think it's important so that you actually understand and believe us that we're not just, we don't just have an agenda here today. We really are trying to help you understand God's word. When Jesus spoke, go and make disciples of all nations, he uses this phrase, ta ethne. Okay, does this word look familiar to any of you? We get the word like ethnic, like basically from this word. So the idea is when he's saying nations, David, he's not saying, he's not in his mind thinking geopolitical countries. I think for most of us as believers, as Americans, when we think nations, we think countries, right? You think about Turkey, the design of this month uh, here at 721 North Parkway is in Turkish design. We think Turkey, or we think um, United States, or we think Argentina. But when Jesus gives his instruction to his disciples, he is not thinking that way, okay? Nope, nope. He is thinking about peoples. That's why your core truth today says the Great Commission is about peoples, not nations. Now, experts define people group as this, all right? A group of people who have a common history, language, religious belief, and cultural identity, okay? Making them consider themselves us and consider others them. So a people group in, in, in Jesus' mind would be, he's thinking about people who are bound together in these, these kinds of things. Yep. Now, the interesting thing is Again, I'm not an expert in missiology or in sociology or any of these world studies, but there are some really smart people who do a lot of research and work in this, and it is ongoing. Today in the world, do y'all know how many countries, geopolitical countries there are? Anybody? 
The answer is 195, okay? There are 195, according to the UN currently, that rec are recognized as geopolitical nations. Now, typically, when we think of the Great Commission, we might think about this number. Mm -hmm. But according to the original language that Jesus is speaking, he's got in mind peoples. How many people groups in the world do you think there are today? Around 17,000. That's the correct answer. Wow. Around 17,000 people groups. So when you get into understanding, David, what Jesus is actually talking about here and the scope of our commission to bring people in relationship with him, to make much of his glory and his grace, he is talking to us saying, look at the peoples of the world and know that my heart is for you to be purposed to see redemption come to each and every distinct people group. And he's got in mind here something more along the lines of the 17,000 number. It's pretty cool. So let's look at an example. Yep. Um, when I say the country Iran, sadly, people today may just think, oh, bad. Um, you know, America is thinking, how are we going to nuke this country? You know, it's the fastest growing church in the world is the Iranians, Persian people. Think like God. We got to think global. And so we look at this country and we say, these are the borders and these are all Iranians. Okay, that's what we would think, right? And that is geopolitical nation, just one nation. But let me show you how God might look at the world. You look at the 94 different people groups. And what's so interesting is, this map doesn't show it, is that these people groups actually aren't inside this border necessarily. They, this group may go into this country, and that group is also in that neighboring country. And so if we could see a map that's just people groups, we wouldn't see all these borders that we know. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a very different look of so a country. When, so you're saying when God looks at Iran, we look at it, we just see Iran yes. <laughs> on the map. But when God looks at Iran, he sees these distinct peoples. Yes. And his heart is for peoples, not just geopolitical nations. Right, okay? right. Um, so that means we've got to, to do some work as it relates to our church and it relates to our understanding of what missions is all about. So let's go back to the definition of people group and let's define it according to a missional perspective, all right? So when we as a church are thinking about the world and we think about people groups of the world, here's what we think about. We define people group as this, the largest group through which the gospel can flow without encountering significant barriers of understanding and acceptance, all right? And now it's built off of that expert definition I gave you earlier, but essentially what we're thinking is, okay, when we go uh, into West Africa, for instance, David, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but what we look at is, okay, I can begin to share the gospel here, but at what point in my gospel sharing in this particular people group does that hit some kind of barrier? Does there, there come some, some frustration of an inability to actually see the gospel move beyond this group? And at that point, there's a difference and at that point, we named right. that as a different people group. So, so there's these two, understanding and acceptance. These are the main, I guess you could say, categories. So understanding, Barrett, is, is one of the main barriers in most parts of the world. And what we're talking about there is language. Yeah. So when we talk about language, I mean, most of us who have been on a short-term trip, you know we got to take translators with us, all right? Um, there's a reason for that. Because if you didn't, you'd have a huge barrier of understanding, right? Now, think about this, though, when you go into the world, David, you know, this is why the work of sending long-term missionaries as a church is so important. Uh, there are people who know very well, who have spent time overseas, who are called and committed long-term, some who, who are even maybe here with us today, who understand the years and years that it takes to actually learn a language mm -hmm. and get to the point of actually having the opportunity to share the gospel and to actually live life with people and to make them disciples of Christ in a way that is truly understood for what it's supposed to mean. And this is why, too, you've got whole organizations around the world that are devoted to actually translating the scripture into native tongues. Like the heart what, language. That's what we call it. They have to hear it in their heart language. Yeah. I was in West Africa. There have been people there for 15 years who have been working on trying to translate the scripture into the Malinke language, David. And there were only three whole books of the Bible that any Malinke person could effectively read on their own uh, because it just takes that much time to translate. But we got to understand that the language piece is so important. What else? There's another part. Yeah. The acceptance we've found. This is also 
a huge barrier. This could be involved with castes, which are these social groupings of peoples, in, in, like in places in South Asia. Religious tradition, you think of religions, this is a huge barrier for them to break through their location. Maybe they're way up in the mountains, or you've got political history, or were hindered in coming into that country. Um, common histories, maybe there's a bad history with Christians. Yeah. Maybe there's a bad history with missionaries. Maybe there's a bad history with the country you're coming from yep. and you're bringing it. Maybe there are legends and that everyone holds them deeply. So these are all kinds of barriers. So when you start thinking about taking the gospel as you go to other peoples, this is what we run into. It's not just a simple, you've got all these different barriers, but this is the work of missions. Yeah. So we've got to learn this stuff, David. Yep. And we've got to be about the work of trying to overcome these barriers so mm -hmm. the opportunity would be there for all people to hear, believe, and follow Christ. Yep. So this is a pretty big deal. This What's is a big shift. Yeah, we could say it's a paradigm shift, right? <laughs> it is. Well, let's talk about paradigm yeah. shifts. So uh, a paradigm shift, you've heard this word, it's become old maybe now, but I'll just tell you what it really means. It's a fundamental change in approach or underlying assumptions. And I'll tell you a little story. Back in 1974, all the Christian leaders in the world got together in Switzerland and they were going to talk about how are we going to finish this great commission. And all these different leaders were getting up and they were sort of congratulating themselves about how much the gospel had gotten to all nations yeah. and churches were being planted in all nations, nations as in geopolitical nations. And then this little bitty missiologist, this little guy uh, named Ralph Winter, he, he stands up and gives his little presentation <laughs> and he sort of pops their bubble. He begins to talk about people groups and he's saying, guys, nations in the Bible, ta ethne, isn't these geopolitical nations. You can't say you've reached Iran just because there's a church in Tehran, the capital. And so he began to talk about, we, we may only have 100 and whatever in those days, nations. He said, but we're talking about people groups. So these poor people are asking him like, how many are you talking about here? And so then he reveals this and it was a watershed moment is what they say. It was a, a huge paradigm in global missions and in global missions, was never the same after that conference, and we, we suddenly now know our new task. Yeah, well, because um, we understand now, you guys, as we look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, this is absolutely from my heart, from our hearts. We understand now what, what remains. Um, this is so important for us to get, because what it means is that as now we study the world through the lens of God, we recognize that that means there are about 2.5 billion people who today are, as best of our estimations can, can show us, still cut off from the saving message of Jesus Christ. In other words, they live in a people group where there, is these, there are these barriers of understanding and acceptance. And that means we, we've got to understand like mm. how much of our world, we might feel good, like David said about there being a presence of a church in geopolitical nations, but that does not mean that everyone in those areas have access to the gospel. And in fact, 2.5 billion today have little to no access to the gospel of Christ, which makes our heart just yearn so much for these people to have opportunity here. And we believe, similar to how 1974 was a watershed moment, that 2021 could be a watershed moment for many in our church who have opportunity to respond to the, to the call of God. Go as you're going. Make disciples. Bring people in relationship. And do that with the scope of all peoples. We, as a church family, can do something to make a difference in the need that still exists, the gospel need that still exists in the world today. So, you know, Piper said... It changed global missions agencies forever. Rick Warren said, no one would ever look at the world the same after 1974. Yep. And I pray that here in 2021, we would say the same. So let's try okay. to make some application yeah. as we close so today. When you, this paradigm shift, how does it change things? Well, if you, if you want to open your, you don't need to do it now, but look up the Uyghur people. This is a people in Western China and they they've are- They've been in the news lately, David. They've been in the news. They're yeah. being persecuted by the Chinese. They're out in Western China. They're an unreached people group. They are a people that are related to Uzbek, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz. 
And I don't have time to explain all to you, but through all this persecution, China's trying to suppress their language, their culture, their religion. And we may see refugees. We may see them begin to come to other countries. And once again, this is one way God brings opportunity for us to engage with them. So this is just a, there are 11 million Muslim Uyghurs. And thank the Lord for all the resources that we have that people are now praying. But, and there are people that are trying to get out to Western yeah. China to reach them. Yeah. Another uh, way we could look at this and you just understand the practical impact of it is looking at our own ICC mission partners. We are so privileged at ICC to have the opportunity to partner with men and women around the globe that are doing great gospel work and uh, among their own people. Um, two of those men, I can, and their families, of course, I can show you right now. One is Chrysidus Erla. Many of us know India. And when we think about go and make disciples of all nations, we just think go and make disciples of India. And it's just kind of this generic sense. But if you don't know already, India's got a lot of people in its country. And even amidst those, you know, billion people plus, uh, there is um, a lot of different people groups. This is just a division of the, the country of India by language. Okay, this is not even taken into consideration other factors, all right? The people group map looks different. This is just languages. So imagine the task for us, the church, in a place like India. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all peoples of India, what does it look like for us to obey God, to have his heart, to see India for what it is, and then to be a part of helping to make disciples in a place like India? Uh, Chrysidus is down here among the Telugu people, but even in that region that's all highlighted Telugu, David, often when we go to do gospel sharing and gospel training in India, there will be a stack of translators. There'll be one translating Telugu and another from Telugu into another language, and that happens also in Ivory Coast, which I want to show you next. Um, Ibele, Idoye, who's our partner in, in Ivory Coast. This is in West Africa. Mm -hmm. The big outline is the outline of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. But this, again, is an overlay of just the languages in that nation. So what you see is the task in Ivory Coast is not just get a church planted in the geopolitical nation, but rather see that God would have an opportunity to be praised among all people, see that those people have an opportunity to know who Jesus is, to know the redemption that he's accomplished, and to be a part of it. Um, I, David, um, lived for about seven months um, uh, when I was a, a younger man um, among the Malinke people. Right but the here. interesting thing is, David, you were talking about Iran earlier. This map doesn't show it. But I actually did not live in Ivory Coast. I was living in Guinea, which is a neighboring nation. Right here. And, then and then so go into the actually the Malinke, yeah, spread over into Guinea. Mm -hmm. But if you, among the people I was living among, they, their primary identity was not with the nation of Guinea, although they loved the, the soccer team. But they very much still considered the Malinke a nation in and of themselves. And go. if you ever wonder why there's so much uh, warring in places like West Africa so often around elections, it's because somebody from one people group gets elected against another people group and it often will break out on the civil war because these arbitrary lines we, we drew for geopolitical nations aren't reflective of the true nature of those, those peoples. But we've got to have a heart to see the world as God sees the world and to yearn for redemption among all peoples in the way that God does. And just as one way to help. And bringing it home, there's a, uh, it changes the way we do. We look at Memphis. Do we have people groups here in Memphis? Absolutely. And we actually have uh, another ICC partner. You might know the couple, Mary, uh, Mark and Cindy. They work amongst Afghans that have come here either as immigrants or as refugees. And there is a people group called the Hazara people that they have a unique love for. And they are an, sort of an Asian, they look more Asian the way they look. They look different from all the other people groups within Afghanistan. They are Muslim, but they are a greatly persecuted uh, people group. They have been, they've had to flee Afghanistan. And what do you know? They end up in Memphis, Tennessee. So when people say, well, how do we reach these people from all the way? God's basically saying, I'm helping you. I'm bringing them right to you. I'll bring them to Bartlett. I'll bring them downtown Memphis. And so that changes the way we do missions in Memphis. Yeah. So we've got to also make that paradigm that God is moving peoples around the world today in a way he's never done. So it's not just going. It's as you go about. And you may be engaging with somebody here in Memphis and you ask them where they're from and you 
when you find out they're from Afghanistan, you say, what is your language? What is your, what do you speak at home? What yeah. is your ethnic? And then you find yeah. out they're Tajik, they're Turkmen. It's very fascinating. Yeah. You know, um, one thing that we are doing this year, okay, the pandemic has brought challenges, but it's also brought opportunities. And Global missions kind of came to a halt, and not the work of global missions at large, but in terms of our church's involvement and being able to send teams. We were really limited this past year. And one of the things we did as a, as a team internally was we said, you know, there's some opportunity here to actually get some things in order and to actually put some things in writing that have always existed in our culture, in our hearts, in our minds, but have never been really expressed um, and to also work on our communication so that we could be effective disciplers in this area of missions. Well, this week, if you are a regular member at our church, you're going to be getting in the mail a magnet that has on that magnet um, information about one of our ICC partners on it. And one of the things we are beginning to do this year that we've never done before, we've always associated a partner with a geopolitical nation. And we are going to begin shifting our own communication toward you to help you understand the partner, yes, with a nation, but also with people groups. And on your magnet that you'll get this week, you'll have opportunity to see the people groups that partner is serving, information about them, percentage of that people group unreached, so that you have opportunity to better understand it and also better pray for it. Um, but one of the things we did, David, was we, we put together these foundation docs and we worked to better define what is global missions in the church at large, but yep. particularly here at ICC. And here's the definition that we came up with. It's not we define global ticket. missions as this. The work of crossing cultural, linguistic, or religious barriers to demonstrate and proclaim the gospel of Christ and to make disciples of him from all people groups in the world. The work of crossing cultural, linguistic, and religious barriers to demonstrate and proclaim the gospel of Christ and to make disciples of him among all people groups in the world. So David, this slide that just went up kind of helps you break it down a little bit. Yep. So that's why we just mentioned that we can't just define missions as going over and doing those things. This is whenever we are engaged in these things, we're in missions. So we are all missionaries. Well, I believe if you engage with someone where you work, where you study, where you live, or you get on a plane, but anytime you cross a cultural, linguistic language, and when you say, I'm not crossing that language, I don't know, I don't, I'm not crossing that barrier, I don't know that language. Well, they're, in, they're speaking their second language which, or third language, which is English. But when you're attempting and you're dealing with language issues, okay, they're in their third language, you're speaking English, but you're trying, you're making the initiative to do this. Yeah. You're not just talking to... Johnny, right next to you, that looks just like you, and he knows your culture, language, and religion. So you're crossing this cultural, linguistic, and religious barriers. When you do that, and you're right in school, or you're at the hardware store, or in your neighborhood, when you do that to proclaim the gospel, to represent the gospel, to proclaim it, and to seek to make disciples of nations, you are doing missions. You're fulfilling a great commission. And that is how we define missions here. We're not just going to make it so specific that we basically forget that God has moved the world all over the place. Yeah. We can make disciples here. We can make disciples of our own kind. But even here in Memphis, we can make disciples of all nations. Well, maybe not all of them, but many nations right here. But it's not just here. It's also there. Because we know that while the world is shaken up, there are many who aren't represented anywhere here in our city. And going is needed of all kinds. So as we are going, we are to be bringing people into understanding of who Jesus is and his heart of redemption, his work of redemption. That is, if, if any would believe, they would have opportunity to be saved. And we can do that of all peoples. It's so beautiful. So we've, in closing today, um, here's, I want to go back to kind of the core truth. The core truth of the day is the Great Commission is not about nations, but about peoples. And my question for you guys would be, you know, do you understand this? Are you willing to receive this? Do you believe this? And how does your life reflect this? Yeah. Um, Jesus came 
his heart and coming. From the beginning, we see God's heart. And Jesus' arrival <laughs> to bring redemption was about every nation. We see this in Revelation 7. We see that he will oversee this work. There is a day coming that there will be people from every nation, tribe, people, and language around the throne. But his heart is that these people would have opportunity to trust and treasure him, to be disciples of him, just as we are. And his heart is that we would be people that represent his heart and live in such a way that as we are going, that we are intentional to see more than just our own people, more than just our own language, more than just our own nation, that have opportunity to trust and treasure him. So that's, that's the heart of today's message. And I'm, I'm just curious, David, you know, in terms of practical application. Right, right. You know, Barrett, I mean, just a couple of things. Um, I think we just, I think God is so honored when we approach him the way he is. And we make a big deal about theology, right? We want to know God and we want to speak of God correctly. Well, we need to remember God is a multicultural, multi-ethnic loving God. He loves these cultures. He loves these spices, these languages. You know, when you get to heaven and you're standing there with your white robe, you're going to hear all these other, I, I, I hope it's like at least for a day or a week, you get to hear all these languages. I wonder if God will just let us bring all our spices for a week and all our different natural, you know, national dress and everything. What a day. And there are people that are nervous when they hear another language. Oh, what's in that food? Is that, oh, is that, that's different. Uh, guys, there may be garlic in heaven, okay? They're, we're going to smell all this stuff. And this is God. And he loves these things. And Barrett, I think it's honoring to God to worship him that way. Worshiping him as a God who loves so the cultures. First, first thing we can do is Worship God as a God of all peoples. Amen. All right? So if you're taking notes, there's going to be three points of application. Number one, we worship. We can worship and appreciate God as a God of all peoples. And his loyalty is to all nations, and ours should be to all nations. Our first passport is in heaven. Not America. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I think we should commit ourselves to think differently. That's why we've gone into these details and why we're taking an entire Sunday to talk about this. We're praying that it would change the way you view the world. The way you read the news, when you see events happening around the world, who are these people groups? The, the Uyghurs in China. Exactly. You know, there's all these political opinions out there. But my word, we're not called first to think in terms of political tribes, uh, political camps, political opinion. We're called to think according to the people of God. Right. How does God see the Uyghur people in China? What would God's desire be? And we got to see the news that way. And when you see the Uyghurs and they're a, a persecuted people, you can look them up on websites like Joshua Project and you can see, wow. This is a large group that the gospel has not been taken to them, and you can pray for them right there. Is that the way we read the news? You know? One quick thing here I didn't yeah. plan to say, but one thing would be to start reading news that's not just American news. You know, Let's stop checking CNN or Fox News or MSNBC so much. How about let's check BBC or some global news service that helps us to even know what's happening outside exactly. of our country. The oxygen gets taken out of the room sometimes, and all we're doing is consumed with America, America, America. Yeah. But we as Christians can think globally, Absolutely. not just nationally. So. And it's how you see maps. It's how you see countries now. You're like, oh, what a pretty map with all these nice little countries. And you go, you know, God doesn't see the world that way. It helps us understand because yeah. we have to get visas to go to that country. Yeah. But God sees the world through peoples. It helps us see the, all the internationals around us. Gee, I wonder, they're from a country, but I wonder what their people group is. And it's really fun to ask them, what language do you speak at home? Um, it, it, it changes how we give towards global missions. These partners that we're trying to focus on and what we want to send out is we're going we're gonna to make it about peoples. Yep. Um, it's going to change how we go overseas with the gospel. And so we have people now who say, uh, where are you going? Well, I'm not going to a country. I will be in a country, but I'm committed to a people yeah. group. People don't understand nowadays. We send missionaries to London for an Iranian people group. And you go, well, oh, they're a missionary to England. No. Why are they a missionary in England? That, right. Doesn't England know the gospel? Wait, wait, no, no, no. Do you understand how God has shifted the world around so where there are tons of Iranians now in England? I'm just using that as a hypothetical, but you can live in England and be a missionary to an unreached group. So we've got to think We're, differently about the way know, the world is working. There's a gal here in the church that went over to Greece. Oh, you're working with Greek people. No, I'm working with all the refugees that are all from the Middle East on these islands, yeah. stuck on these islands. Yeah. Thirdly, Barrett, I think it changes lastly, the way we... 
What did you say? I said, and lastly, some people and look lastly, for that. And lastly, okay, yeah. number three. <laughs> lastly, how we pray um, and how we pray for all, that God would reach all the people. So I think as you pray, we hope it changes your mentality. You know, Lord, we really need prayer in our cities or we're going through all this stuff in our country. When are we going to get the vaccine? When are we going to get, you know, God always wants us to think beyond that. So we hope it just, we just want to be global people. That's what we all, we want everybody yeah. to be global Christians yeah. and not in their own world. So we hope that, we hope this is, we want this to set a pattern I think for it was who we are. John Stott that said we ought to be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a global God.